Welcome back to another video. This time around we'll be talking about how to quantify risk. Now risk generally is seen as a bad term. However, I just want to quickly explain to you that risk isn't always bad. Risk being high is bad. Risk being low is bad. When the outcome is bad. Risk being high can sometimes be good if the outcome is good. Risk is generally seen as somewhat of a hostile word because you know you can always hear people say, oh, that was a risky play, oh, that was a risky move. But in, in this idea, risk pretty much just means your chance of developing the disease. Before we start with this video, I just want to quickly highlight to you that uh, it's going to be using a very similar 2x2 two two table to the one that you see in the previous page about uh, evaluation of diagnostic tests. I actually have a video on that. Uh, if you'd like to go see it, I urge you to go see it because we're going to be using the same sort of paradigm that we're going to be uh, doing here. Uh, if you're already familiar with, with this uh, sort of table, then this table is no different. The only difference here is that instead of test here, we're not using test. We're using exposure or intervention. So pretty much we're putting people, let's say for example we're doing a cohort study, we're putting people into two different groups. One that is exposed, one that is not exposed. And then we're seeing each group's risk of developing the disease and then we're reporting them sometimes the exposure can actually benefit the group sometimes the exposure can worsen the chance of, of them developing the disease commonly tested ways to quantify risk involve the odds ratio and relative risk uh, they are very similar to each other and that's that's actually because uh, they they sort of tell the same story but in different perspectives and different ways now what do i mean by that let's imagine you're a detective and if you ask, for example, the mother uh, what happened uh, at, at the crime scene and she tells you a story and then you go ask the father and he gives you a, a different story, but he's somewhat describing um, uh, the same events, but in, in his perspective, that's exactly what odds ratio and relative risk are. They're sort of the same thing. They're sort of trying to describe the same thing, but in their own different way. Now, um, they have a small distinction between them, which will be clear when we talk about their formulas. When we talk about odds ratio, and when we talk about relative risk, the only difference is that one uses proportions and one uses ratios. Now you can probably guess which one uses ratios. It's going to be odds ratio. So odds ratio, the formula goes as such, A over B over C over D. Very, very simple, very, very easy to remember. Relative risk, it's going to use proportions, A over A plus B over C over C plus D. Now, I'm going to assume that you already understand the difference between case control study and cohort studies. If not, I have actually a video uh, talking about the study design, so feel free to go watch that if, you, if you'd like to see more detail. But in that video, I was uh, talking about how uh, the formula actually, you can relate the formula to this, uh, why they picked this study design. So I'm actually going to go back to this, to this whiteboard and explain this to you really quickly. Just a small little note, this will, will hopefully never be tested on, on your step or possibly any board exam. I'm not quite sure on, on the any board exam part there, but on, on steps, uh, I, don't, I don't think they really care about this. They care more about how, can you calculate relative risk, can you calculate odds ratio, and uh, th that should be that. But if you're interested in finding out why they use uh, cohort with relative risk and case control, with odds ratio, then uh, I'll just st spend a minute on it. So why is this the case? Well, the answer is actually here. The reason that they uh, are actually using you know, relative risk for, for cohort studies and, and case control for odds ratio is because relative risk uses proportions and odds ratio uses ratios. Now, proportions, they, they tend to mean something. In this case, they actually are depicting the prevalence among the exposed and the prevalence among the unexposed. Uh, that is to say that, that th this should pretty much be very, very close to the natural prevalence. And since cohorts, by design, doesn't really care about distinguishing disease as it is distinguish the exposure, it generally depicts the natural prevalence within its study. However, with case control studies, that is thrown out, out the window. You are handpicking people with disease and trying to, to make one group with, for example, 50 people with diabetes and 50 people without diabetes. The prevalence is already out the window. It is nothing like the natural prevalence. Therefore, we can't really use proportions. Proportions are sort of meaningless. That is to say, if you actually apply relative risk to case control, and if you apply odds ratio to, to a cohort study, then you're going to figure out that they, they do give you an answer. But that answer is not as meaningful if you were to use the proper way to quantify that risk. 
And the answer is, is pretty much because one uses proportions, which depict the natural prevalence, and one uses ratios because the study design, by, by its design, uses a biased sample with more people uh, that have the disease, therefore not depicting, not depicting the natural prevalence. Okay, so if we go back here, I just have a quick little mnemonic to show you. Uh, odds ratio, OR, two different letters. You can remember that with case control, AO, so uh, two different letters, a, uh, OR, two different letters, AO. For relative risk, just remember, cohort, OO, -O, remember, RR, relative risk. So that's just an easy way to remember it. And uh, again, if you, if you need to remember which one uses the ratios, which one uses the proportions, always remember odds ratio. So you, then you focus, you, you pretty much remember that, oh, odds ratio uses the ratio, so the other one uses the proportions. So that's just a quick way to not mix you up. We have two more notes here. Uh, one, of, one of the notes is that for rare diseases, odds ratio approximates relative risk. Now, uh, how can we explain this? If we actually go to a whiteboard, it'll make a lot more sense. There is actually a way to do this. Uh, through hard numbers and deriving the formula. However, uh, uh, no one even bothers asking you this, so I'd rather use just a logical way of, of making it. Remember the whole paradigm I was talking about where, where I was discussing how uh, relative risk depicts the natural prevalence, but this one does not? Just imagine it like this. If you have odds ratio and you have relative risk, if you have these two, and the prevalence of the disease you're interested in is already low, already low, then you cannot get a biased sample here anyway. You can't get a biased sample because the prevalence is already low. You're forced into a low prevalence. You can't raise it uh, regardless of how hard you try. The prevalence is already, is already low. For that reason, pretty much these two are going to coincide. These two are going to be very, very, very similar. Once again, recall that the, the really on the only difference between these two is that this one was depicting the natural prevalence, but this one wasn't. Uh, the second you get rid of that, pretty much they're going to be the same. The last point we have here is about relative risk. It's it's this part right here, and this part is really important. Basically, telling you that if the relative risk is is greater than one, that means that the exposure is actually associated with an increased disease occurrence. Uh, the exposure actually increases the risk of you developing the disease. Uh, with with relative risk less than one, then the exposure decreases the chance of you developing the disease. If it was equal to one, then the exposure pretty much does not uh, increase or decrease your chance of getting the disease. And these are really important because sometimes they just tell you, oh, the relative risk, for example, equals two. What does this two mean? And you have to explain to them exactly what this two means. Now, I'm not going to go over the examples, but they're really helpful for, for uh, explaining to you what exactly this two means. Uh, so I, I urge you to go through them, but I'm, I'm not going to go through them here because uh, they're going to take too much time. All right, then we move on to... Um, this whole page, which is um, sort of new for a lot of people. I, I can tell you from, from myself, uh, when I learned these, I learned them myself because um, personally, uh, my in-house exams never focused on them. They are more focused instead with, with uh, hypothesis testing uh, and, and alpha errors and beta errors, so on and so forth. And for that reason, uh, we didn't really have enough time to really go over these. But uh, they're very important. They sometimes get tested on, on step one. Uh, so you need to be familiar with them. So let's start with the first one, relative risk reduction. The relative risk reduction, it has to come with a relative risk that is less than one. That is to say that the exposure is lessening your chance of disease. That's why they're giving the example of a vaccine here. Now, what they're basically trying to say is that in, instead of reporting that, that in this example, uh, going from 8% to 2% is, is basically a decrease of 6%, instead of saying that, instead of saying 6%, they're giving it another name. They're giving it something called relative risk reduction, which basically puts the 6% in a different format. It puts it into this uh, relative risk reduction format. The only way you can reach that is by doing 1 minus relative risk. So I don't know the relative, they, they give it to you here. Uh, 2 out of 8, you just do 2 out of 8 minus 1, and then you're going to get basically 6 out of 8, which is 3 fourth. So that's how they got this number. Again, this number is basically trying to be this number. It's just that they, they, they're trying to say the same thing, but in different ways. And one of the ways you can do that is by reporting it as a relative risk reduction. It's more focused on the relative risk rather than the actual percentage. Uh, I'm going to skip attributable risk because what if we want to report this 6%? Well, how do we do that? We actually just take this number and we minus it from this number. Now, how did they originally get this number? It was just a proportion. It was the proportion of those that are unexposed, unexposed, that develop the disease, in this case, 8%, 
minus those who are exposed, in this case vaccinated, who develop a disease. In this case, you actually go down 6%. So we can say, oh, the, act, the absolute risk reduction to the flu vaccine is 6%. Again, the formula is very clear. The proportion of those who, who are unexposed, who develop a disease, minus those who are exposed, who develop a disease. Now let's go back to attributable risk. It's actually the same as absolute risk reduction. The only difference there is that instead of instead of it being protective, it's actually being, uh, it's, it's increasing your chances of developing the disease with the exposure. So again, th this one, your, your relative risk has to be greater than one. This one, your relative risk, has to be has to be uh, less than one because this has to be protective. That's the only way it's going to reduce the risk. This one has to be more because that's the only way it will increase the risk. So so you'd imagine the only thing you need to do is just flip these two around, and that's exactly what they do here. A over A plus B minus C over C plus D basically be the exposed minus the unexposed because the exposed will be the larger number. In this case, in this example, they give you them as as 21% uh, and the, the the unexposed are 1%. So the attributable risk is 20%. Another way you can reach that, I'm sorry if, if you're not seeing it, but it's basically, uh, they might just give you the relative risk. They might not give you all of these numbers in, in the table. They might not give you this all, all this table. So instead, they, they just might give you the relative risk. And uh, the only way you can answer it is by using this formula. And this formula, you can reach the same exact answer as using this formula, but they might not give you this given. They might instead just give you the relative risk. You just do relative risk minus 1 over relative risk. And then to make it a, a, a percentage, you just multiply it by 100. So this should be good for relative risk reduction, attributable risk, and absolute risk reduction. So this leaves us with the last three, number needed to treat, number needed to harm. I'm going to group these as one, and case fatality rate. Case fatality rate is actually very simple. I'm going to start with it first. Basically, you take the number of deaths and you put it on top of all of the cases. The, the example really, really makes it simple. If you have four patients that die from meningitis among 10 cases in the hospital, for example, then it'll be 4 over 10 number of deaths, number of cases, times 100 to make it a percentage, and that will give you basically 40%. This is how they report uh, case fatality rate for, for uh, different cases. But now let's, let's close this video off with number needed to treat and number needed to harm. So you could just memorize it. The mnemonic here is very simple. Uh, harm, AR, so basically harmed, AR. And you always put one over AR, and then that, that's pretty much your mnemonic. The other one, number D to treat, will be the double the double R. Uh, it's a very very simple way of, of handling it, but uh, let's try let's try and take it an extra step and see why they made this formula. So let's just make a quick little example. Let's say after doing our our two by two table, yada yada yada. Let's say one group's chances of developing a disease is 25, and let's say our exposed group was 15 percent. 15 percent. Uh, we minus them from each other, and that gives us our absolute risk reduction. That's going to be 10%. Sorry, 10%. So equal, equal. So now we have an absolute risk reduction of 10%. Now they tell us, well, how many do we need to treat for this 10% to actually help one person? All right. So the the way the formula goes, I'll just show you how this formula goes. It goes one over one or 10, sorry, over 100. I was just going to simplify, but 10 over 100. Now, if we take this formula and we get an answer, I'll, sh I'll show you how they got it. We just put this over 1, we crisscross, and then uh, 100 over 10 equals 10. What this 10 means is that we need, to, we need to treat 10 patients in order to basically benefit 1. Every time we treat 10 patients, we will be benefiting one person, as opposed to be using using the old method with the, with the 25% chance of, of people. So, so how did they how did they come up with this formula? Why does this formula work so well? It's actually very simple. What, what they're doing is is extremely simple. They just put this equal sign in the middle, and then they put 10 over 100, which is which is this percentage, this absolute risk reduction right here. And then what they do is is very simple. They put one over question mark or x or whatever and, and solve for the for the missing number you can see 10 over 100 equals 1 over how many how many do you need to treat in order to save one person and you can already see the answer it's, it's going to be basically 1 out of 10 because 1 out of 10 is going to equal 10 out of 100 and that's where they got that that's where they got the answer this question mark this variable if you solve for it is going to be the exact same value as this so that's how they do it they, they just put absolute reduction on this side 
and it equals 1 over x. And then just solve for x. The same exact logic goes to number needed to harm. The only difference is instead of using uh, the, the absolute risk reduction, you're using attributable risk. And this makes sense because when, when you're treating patients, you want the exposure to lessen the chance of disease. But with number needed to harm, you need the, the, the exposure to increase the chance of disease. So it sort of makes sense why you need to use ARR for number needed to treat and why you need to use AR for number needed to harm. And with that said, hopefully you benefited from this video. Consider liking and subscribing, and as always, thanks for watching.